Good evening, everyone. My name is Elaine Smith, and as Deputy Presiding Officer, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Scottish Parliament this evening and to the grand final of the 2015 Donald Dewar Memorial Debating Tournament. I'm really delighted that I'm chairing this prestigious event for the first time, particularly since the, the Dewar debate is a real highlight in our parliamentary calendar. Having presided over proceedings in this chamber throughout this week and this afternoon, I'm really looking forward to hearing the arguments and ideas of our younger speakers this evening. And it's absolutely fantastic to see our MSP seats are filled with school pupils. 128 teams representing schools from around the country set out on the road to Holyrood in November last year. 32 first round heats, 16 second round heats and four semi-finals have now whittled the field down to four talented teams who are going to be competing in this evening's grand final. So my congratulations to our finalists who I will introduce shortly and to the other four schools who are taking up the seats on the chamber floor this evening. They will have the opportunity to participate in the open floor debates during the course of our proceedings. This competition is organised by the Law Society of Scotland and I offer my thanks to everyone at the Society for all of their hard, works and, hard work and their efforts in this regard. And I would also like to thank the tournament sponsors, Hodder Gibson Publishers and the Glasgow Bar Association for their much valued support. Following the untimely death of Donald Dewar, Scotland's first First Minister in the early years of this Parliament, this debating tournament was then dedicated to Donald's memory. I had the privilege of knowing Donald personally as I was, like him, elected to the Scottish Parliament in 1999. Donald Dewar was a student of history and law and practised as a solicitor in between periods of serving as a member of the House of Commons, where he represented seats in Aberdeen and Glasgow before he became an MSP. He was a member of the Glasgow University Dialectic Society and he was a frequent participant in its debates alongside contemporaries, many of whom have gone on into high profile jobs in politics, law and the media. Donald retained his passion for debating right through his political career in the House of Commons and of course in the early days of this Parliament. And in his maiden speech in the new Scottish Parliament, Donald stated, Today there is a new voice in the land, the voice of a democratic parliament, a voice to shape Scotland, a voice for the future. I think it's fitting, therefore, that occupying the seats of our parliamentarians tonight are potentially the lawmakers, the politicians and the lawyers of the future. <laughs> and I think it's uh, also fitting that this chamber continues to reverberate to the sound of a new generation of debaters through this annual competition. And I hope that this experience has a positive and lasting effect on all of your futures. Finally, joining us in the public gallery this evening are many proud parents, classmates and teachers. And it's wonderful to see all of you here tonight as well. And I hope you enjoy your evening here at Holyrood. I wish all of the finalists the very best of luck. And I hope you all have a really enjoyable evening here tonight in your Scottish Parliament. Thank you all very much. Could I congratulate the four schools who have made it through to the final? So they are Presswick Academy, Madras College, Lanark Grammar and St Mary's Music School. Congratulations to all of you. I will now outline the format of the debate. I will call on the first proposition speaker to speak and they will have six minutes. I will then call on the first opposition speaker to speak and they will also have six minutes. And that is repeated then for the second proposition and the second opposition speakers. And then after that, we will open the debate to the floor. During these four speeches, I will verbally announce when your first minute is up. And this will indicate that interventions are now permitted, should you wish to take them. I will also verbally indicate when you have entered your last minute and at that point, no interventions will be taken. 
When your six minutes is up, I will ask you to wind up. And if you continue further, I will ask you again to wind up after 30 seconds. So, please remember that I am quite well experienced in keeping my fellow MSPs to time. And with plenty of clocks around the chamber, I would expect uh, our debaters to please observe your time limits. The debate will then, after that, be opened up to the floor for a further 15 minutes um, before we hear the reply speeches from the opposition and proposition. The reply speeches should last no more than three minutes. There will be no interventions in those speeches, and I will verbally announce when you have entered your last minute. I would also encourage um, as many of you as possible to participate in the floor debate, and bear in mind that the judges will award a £50 book voucher to the best speaker from the floor over the course of this evening. So it's worth your while to think about participating. Um, I would like to remind the teams that it is your choice if you choose to respond to any points raised during the floor debate, but please be aware that your performance will not be judged on the floor debate. The motion for debate today is this House would restrict media coverage of terrorist attacks. And our presiding judge is Stephen Doherty, Head of Conflict Resolution at Wright Johnson & Mackenzie. He will be joined by John Dye, former Chairman of the English Speaking Union in Scotland, Irene McGrath, Chair of the Scottish Schools International Debating Council, and Rob Mars, former Speeches and Debates Officer at the English Speaking Union in Scotland. So I hope that's all clear. We'll try and clarify it further as we go along, if necessary. Could I now ask Madras College and Presswick Academy to leave the chamber through the door at the back, and after they do so, we will commence with the first debate. Thank you. Walking across the floor is not usually allowed when the Parliament is in session, but I think we can allow it on this occasion. <laughs> so, now that the teams have left, um, I would like to call on Anna Mikkels from St Mary's Music School to open the debate as the first proposition speaker. Anna, six minutes, please. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Presiding Officer and Honourable Judges. I would like to propose to you the motion that this House would restrict media coverage of terrorist attacks. Terrorism, defined by the 2000 Act, is an attack or threat designed specifically to manipulate the government or to intimidate the public. According to the Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre, the current risk of terrorism is severe in the UK, meaning that although there is no current risk, an attack is highly likely. Furthermore, in the last 14 years, seven counter-terrorism bills have been passed. These frightening facts only clarify and show that terrorism is an extremely current issue and something has to be done. The problem is that the media is only worsening the issue. Currently, the media's use of extreme language and excessive amount of information is not only striking fear into the public, but is also giving the terrorists exactly what they want. Publicity. One minute. By media, we mean legitimate sources of news, this being newspapers and their online equivalents, and all television and radio news from the United Kingdom, sources of information which we trust for their reliability. According to the Ofcom News Consumption Report, 95% of adults follow the news. Over a quarter of these same adults said that the BBC was the most important news source to them. Reliable news sources such as the BBC are respected and are used every day by a significant majority of our nation. These, the significant trust we place in these sources shows how easily influenced we are and shows how easily influenced we can be to terrorism publicity. Our team for the proposition would propose a new law whereby when an attack has taken place, only the most basic factual details would be publicised on legitimate sources of news. These factual details being that the attack has taken place, the time and destination of the attack and the number of people killed or injured. This day, we are not denying the public information merely denying these terrorists the oxygen of publicity on which they thrive. 
I, as first proposition, would like to talk about why a new law would decrease this fear our society lives on, and also why the law would improve effective government decisions. My partner Richard will then go on to talk about the benefits this new law would have on society. Every day, people watch the news to see what's going on in the world, and they have this right. The proposition are in no means trying to take away this right. But every day, people are being terrorised by media coverage of terrorist attacks. Don't have, um, the, if people don't see things or if they don't get a full description, then would they not imagine things and potentially think that it was worse than it was? The thing is, this extra information that you are supposedly saying we need to have is not actually beneficial to anybody's view. In fact, it's just increasing fear and it's also um, making stereotypes much more fearful, which is what Richard will go on to say. For example, this tragedy, this this fear we're talking about was recently represented in the Charlie Hebdo tragedy in France. The tragedy had a huge response from the media in the UK. Headlines in the newspapers the following day were things such as massacred at work, barbaric, war on freedom. This kind of language is completely and utterly petrifying. And again, the media have let exactly the kind of publicity the terrorists want. Of course, we all know headlines as extreme and dramatic and petrifying as this will sell money. But I put it to you that if the media co coverage was to be restricted to the basic information, the mere facts, this kind of behaviour would have much less impact and potentially decrease the number of these atrocities. The first duty of government is to keep a country safe. And yet, as I said earlier, with the current risk of a terrorist attack at severe, we are far from this. Terrorists commit these atrocities to manipulate the government by using threats until they've done exactly what they want. The government sometimes has to make impossible decisions, ones which, although may seem horrific and inhumane to the media, are only made to fulfil their first duty, our safety. By sensationalising terrorist attacks, media continuously puts unjust pressure on the government at a time when they have to make crucial decisions. If this pressure was lifted, the government would be able to make these decisions far more effectively, subsequently securing a safer environment for us to live in. In matters of national security, the government does not have to let the public know every detail when it regards to terrorism. T restrictions are already in place whereby the need-to-know policy filters out information that the public can and cannot know, and this policy has been proven extremely important, if not vital, to events in the past. One minute to go. In World War II, information was withheld from the public for their own safety. If this information had been published, not only would they have been extremely terrified, but their safety would have been compromised. There are constant issues in the media, so one may ask, why terrorism? Why is this such a big issue? Why does it stand out from the other others? Well, I put it to you that this stands out because it challenges the right to life. Human right number three states, we all have the right to life and to live in freedom and safety. If we can do something to reduce or even stop terrorist attacks occurring, it is our duty as a nation and a government to do it. After all, without this fundamental right, all of the others would be meaningless. Theresa May, our current Home Secretary, said, we must act together as a nation to confront, challenge and defeat terrorism and all its forms and stand up and speak out for our fundamental values. Let us confront terrorism by standing up and speaking for our rights Conclude, and challenge the media to sit down. Thank you for listening and I urge you to vote for the proposition. Thank you very much, Anna. Now, could I ask Rachel Miller from Lanark Grammar to please respond as the first opposition speaker. Rachel, six minutes, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, my colleague Rihanna and I will be opposing the motion. I'm going to talk about the importance of freedom of speech and highlight the potentially detrimental impacts of censorship of the media. Later this evening, Rihanna will be discussing the significance of terrorism as a news story and highlight the potentially detrimental impacts further of um, censoring terrorism, but also discuss the positive impacts of public awareness of terrorism. However, before I begin my arguments tonight, I would like to offer some points of rebuttal. 
But the opposition have said that we're only going to see extra information that isn't beneficial. I want to know how the proposition plan to decide what is beneficial and what is not. It is not up to the government or a body which has not been identified by the proposition to decide what is beneficial for the people. It's up to um, the executives in big companies such as the BBC, but also the viewers, because things like the BBC are a business. One so minute. it's going to be what the, um, what the viewers want to see that they are going to um, show. They also talked about how the Charlie Hebdo coverage um, created fear. However, we also saw the Je suis Charlie march and many cases where there was common humanity that rose above terrorism. I would question whether or not this would be included as um, essential information for the public. Finally, they talked about how the government restricts information, which is clearly vital to safety. However, this would not be... Um, the media and the government are not the same thing. So we can't restrict journalists from showing information um, because they're not going to have the information that's vital to our safety. The government and the media are two separate things. Uh, no, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, freedom of speech and of the press is one of the fundamental pillars of democratic society, both in the UK and the wider world. It is an undeniable truth that this motion will, by its very nature, limit the extent to which um, the freedom of the press and of individuals to share their experiences. We um, on the opposition feel that allowing such a restriction of a fundamental right is allowing terrorists to achieve their aims. We cannot support terrorists in their desire to disrupt daily life and democracy by limiting freedom of speech. The Euro yes. We do not intend to limit freedom of speech. What we intend to limit is the detrimental effects of terrorism and the fear that they produce in our society. If you're limiting what the media can and cannot say and you're limiting, limiting it to basic information, then you are limiting the, the freedom of the speech of the, um, of the journalists and of the media. You are still limiting it. The European Parliamentary Assembly Committee on Culture, Science and Education, in a report on media and terrorism, states that terrorism should not affect the importance of freedom of expression and information in the media as one of the essential foundations of democratic society. This freedom carries with it the right of individuals to be informed on matters of public concern, including terrorist acts and threats. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear that we, as part of a democratic society, do have the right to be informed on significant events such as terrorism, and to surrender such a right would be dangerous. We are concerned it would be dangerous because it is unclear whether or not victims of terrorist attacks would still have a platform upon which to share their experiences under this motion. If the motion restricts coverage to only basic details, does that include victims sharing their experiences or witnesses sharing what they have seen? The proposition have not explained where the line is going to be drawn, and therefore there is the risk that victims could be criminalised or at least restricted. If a victim decided to share their loss with a newspaper or a witness with the BBC, would they be viewed as criminals having broken the law which restricts media coverage to only basic information? Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot support a motion which has the potential to criminalise victims. Censorship could, uh, the sec, censorship could also have the impact of ignorance with regards to terrorism. Yeah. Want to criminalise innocent individuals? This is why we're leaving this. We're creating a piece of legislation which will be enforced by the government, and therefore it becomes a government responsibility. And they won't let their people become criminals. Well, I think there's a lot of criminals at the moment, but the point is, if you you haven't defined what basic information is going to be, so a victim discussing their loss might not be viewed as basic information, and you haven't given us the information and the details in your definition of the motion to decide whether or not victims are going to be criminalised. No, thank you. And if something is legislation and you go against that, that is breaking the law, so you would be criminalised. But in any case, they're still going to be restricted. Now. With, if, with regards to the ignorance, if you or I were in an airport, for example, and saw an unattended bag or other suspicious activity, we would report it. Hopefully it would be innocuous, but it's always better to be overcautious than complacent, which is exactly what would occur under this motion, as people would not Find have a, a realistic knowledge of terrorism. Most importantly, there have been instances where public awareness of terrorism has led to lives being saved due to coverage. For example, following the Boston Marathon bombings, pictures of the escaped terrorists were broadcast on every channel. The unprecedented manhunt which ensued ultimately ended when a member of the public recognised the suspect from media coverage and was able to contact the police who captured him. 
Had there not been such a high volume of media coverage, it is highly likely that that man would not have recognised the terrorist, who could have gone on to commit other horrific acts. Indeed, he confessed to having planned to bomb Times Square after the Boston Marathon. The unprecedented loss of life which would have undoubtedly occurred was prevented in part due to media coverage. This coverage also made sure that people stayed safe, as it was through the media that the police informed citizens to stay inside and that public transport and services were closing. Therefore, you can see that as well as there have been many positive impacts Conclude, of media coverage, there were also the dangerous impacts of censorship. So I urge you to support the opposition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Can I now invite Richard Montgomery, second proposition speaker, to give us his views, please? Richard, six minutes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for your attention in this debate so far. I think it's quite clear from what we've heard at the moment that I have an immediate duty, as the opposition seems unclear about our definition of the motion. And I'm actually going to read out what Anna has already said. Our team for the proposition would propose a new law whereby when an attack has taken place, only the most basic factual details would be published on legitimate sources of news. These factual details being that the attack has taken place, the time and the location of the attack, number of people killed or injured. So really, to put it in even more simple terms, just for the clarification of everyone, we're going to report where, when, number of casualties. That is all, because that removes any ambiguity and will keep our people safe but, uh, by not exacerbating the fear which is already existing in our society, as I'm going to show. Because society is really what I want to focus on in this secondary case for the proposition. At the moment, we've already looked at this from a perspective of national security, and that's both proposition and opposition I'm talking about. Yes, please. Um, so you have clarified then that you would be restricting victims because they would not be allowed to um, express their experiences through media because they are, of course, only allowed date, time, Thank you. place. What was also clarified in our definition was that we will be restricting legitimate sources of media as identified by the Ofcom News Consumption Report. So therefore, social media will be open to these people. We, do, we want to be able to embrace these... Um, well, I, don't, I say embrace these atrocities, be welcoming to the people who have suffered from them. Yes, please. He is a well-respected source. So what if victims want to talk to the BBC or another media outlet because they would have a wider coverage and some victims want to explain Thank you. their loss? I can understand that need to explain very clearly. As I say, there are other ways of going about this. Perhaps talking to an actual person would be more beneficial. I just feel that the way that the media, mainstream media, which we look up to and respect, which we see as legitimate, is then enhancing fear, as I'm about to talk about. So Anna has already demonstrated how the sensational reporting of the media exacerbates this fearful atmosphere in our population and how this plays into the hands of the terrorists. We can't get away from the terrorists. I respect you greatly for your altruistic motives in protecting the victims, but we have to remember the terrorists at the heart of this. We cannot play into their hands, and that is exactly what the media does by enhancing the fear which we experience. But furthermore, this fear creates a huge obstacle to achieving equality and interracial harmony. What we see, and there are numerous examples, just, um, I mean, it's 10 years ago now, I think, the July the 7th bombings, but it's still resonating today. And although in itself the attack was horrific, the events which spiralled out of it were equally as bad. We saw huge um, spikes in racial incidents towards Muslim communities. No, thank you. Because of the way that the media was portraying this as a Muslim attack, this is why we want to restrict it to far more basic details, just the essence of the story, not saying who is doing this. It is enough to know that there are terrorists threatening our peace, and therefore we can leave it to the government, who have greater freedom then, to deal with the issue. So that's one problem which our society is facing at the moment, these stereotypes which are creating obstacles to equality, which is something which is in the news all the time now. No, thank you. But another one which we are facing, and perhaps more alarming, is the radicalisation of our vulnerable people. Now, there are 
radicalisation is a very complex issue. But what we are interested in is why do people get um, why do people get there in the first place? It's often cited that material on the internet can cause people to become radicalised, but why are they looking for it in the first place? Well, actually, there's been a great deal of recent research into this field. For example, the findings of internationally renowned terrorism expert Martha Crenshaw. And what we're now discovering is that the evidence which explains radicalisation is pointing towards social alienation. And where, 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 what is that reminding me of? The fear that the exacerbated um, media reportings no, thank you, um, are creating. By portraying terrorists as particular minority groups, at the moment it's Muslims, in the past it's been the IRA and various other organisations, by giving this unrepresentative view, and it is unrepresentative, this may shock you to learn, it Final certainly minute. did me, that uh, in the last five years, less than 2% of all terrorist attacks in Europe have been perpetrated by Muslims. That is a fact which is not being represented by our mainstream media at the moment. So therefore, we don't want to give them the option of being disproportionate and un unrepresentative. So that's where we're seeing this direct link to the uh, media. It's reinforcing these stereotypes, and as a result of it, we're creating more fear and more moral panic. So it's acting out in a spiral. We see fear across um, our country society as a whole. This fear alienates people, and the alienation causes radicalisation, which causes further terrorism in a tragic, self-fulfilling prophecy. So, in proposing this motion, we have shown you that this is a current problem. Remember that terrorism risk at the moment in the UK is severe. But we have provided a solution. As Anna has said, the media's, court, uh, the media's coverage Conclude, of terrorist please. attacks impacts national security. And as I hope I have now made clear, it goes beyond this by deeply affecting the way our society organises itself. Restricting media coverage of terrorist attacks will resolve this issue. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Richard. Can I now ask Rihanna McGrath, second opposition speaker, to address us, please? Sorry, six minutes, Rihanna. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Presiding Officer, fellow debaters. Tonight, a motion stands before us which threatens our freedom of speech and information, criminalises victims by denying them media coverage of their experiences, and puts at risk the safety of the general public. Therefore, tonight, I am going to discuss some of the reasons why this act would not only be foolish, but may result in a number of dangerous repercussions. However, firstly, I would like to offer some points of rebuttal. The proposition have said that the public safety would be compromised, or has been compromised, by media coverage. But in what way does knowledge compromise people's safety, I have to ask? Also, um, you've said that victims, instead of talking to the media, should talk to an actual person, that that would be more beneficial for them. Well, of course, we're assuming that these people have been through One incredibly minute. traumatic experiences and would, of course, be talking to somebody else, but it is important for them to share with the public what they have suffered through. And, in effect, it actually helps people to come together... No, thank you. ..to come together and fight terrorism together. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, terrorism is no longer just a political struggle. It's not a wartime event. It's happening all around us. Terrorists walk into our daily lives. It's in a coffee shop in Australia. It's in a kosher deli in France or a journalist's office in Paris and even in the streets of London. Terrorism is among us and it is our right not only to share our personal experiences of terrorism through the media, but it is also our right to hear it, to see it and to listen to one another. Otherwise, we become complacent about an issue of national security, which puts at risk innocent people from preve uh, potentially preventable attacks. Some fear the recruitment of our young citizens through social media, which you have touched upon. Um, but the coverage of terrorism, given, giving terrorists what is called the oxygen of publicity, is as much a weapon in our hands as it is in theirs. Social media is a counterintelligence nightmare for Islamic State militants. As former FBI official Clint Watts points out, social media offers a window into what's going on in Iraq and Syria right now. Intelligence services, no thank you, 
can use social media to determine the identities of supporters and potential recruits, flagging individuals not previously on the government's radar, and using data analysis to trace entire networks of contacts. Furthermore, they can communicate anonymously with actual potential terrorists, feeding them misinformation. Yes? Um, we're not... We're not, for the purposes of this debate, we're not talking about internet. We're saying internet can have opinions expressed freely on it. We're talking about legitimate sources of news, stuff that we can censor, that we can control. I understand that you made this point, but I'm afraid Richard also brought up social media in his debate, and I feel like if you feel it's important to touch on, then I also feel it is important to touch on. Internationally renowned security technologist Brishnir has said the danger of not reporting on terrorist attacks is greater than the risk of continuing to report them. Freedom of the press is a security measure. The only tool we have to keep our government honest is public disclosure. Once we start hiding pieces of reality from the public, either through legal censorship or self-imposed restraint, we end up with a government that acts based upon secrets and decides what the public should or should not know. Yes. But that enhances our, our understanding of terrorism is completely false. Well, not completely false, but is giving a completely disproportionate um, view of terrorism. As Richard said, the 2%, less than 2% of Muslims that didn't commit well, the majority of these we, crimes. On the opposition here, we don't condemn Muslims. We don't believe that there's a strong racial hatred towards Muslims generated by media coverage of terrorism. Terrorism itself may you know, occur from Muslim origin, but it's not technically the religion as has been established quite recently in the news. It is more a culture which has evolved um, from the religion. And of course, the religion preaches peace as well as any other religion, Christianity, Hinduism. And so um, we, we don't believe that, um, that, um, that, that there is some kind of racial discrimination here. It's, it's not based on that. The media doesn't focus on that. The media focuses on positive impacts. Um, therefore, we on the opposition believe that the restriction of media coverage on terrorism would not only close the door for intelligence services to gain insight into terrorist movements, but it would also have a hugely negative impact on the way our society collectively views the government and would only serve to break down the fundamental pillars of freedom of speech Final and democracy minute. which support our system of government. Ladies and gentlemen, attempting to prevent the public from facing the realities of, the events in, of events in the international world is doomed to fail. People will always face exposure to terrorism. Preventing this freedom of information could have the negative impacts on our society that Rachel and I have already highlighted tonight. However, media coverage of these attacks often focuses on the silver linings that surface, the humanity which is ironically brought out in society when we experience tragedy. The media doesn't focus on the attackers themselves, nor the gory, violent details. It focuses on the heroes who emerge to help others in times of such complete horror. For example, the media coverage of the terrorist attack on Glasgow Airport in 2007 was centred centred on a baggage handler who risked his life to prevent a terrorist attack which could have killed hundreds of people. The name of that man is still engraved in the minds of the nation. Most people in this room will still remember the heroic actions of John Smeaton, even eight years after the attack. But can anyone remember the names of the two terrorists? Conclude, please. Another example is the positive impact that we had with the Twin Towers, um, where 300 charities were set up to aid the victims and heroes of 9-11. They raised together $2.8 billion. And this was created um, by the storm of media attention the attack generated. Without the media, none of this would have been possible. So thank you for listening tonight, and I would urge you to support the opposition. Thank you very much, Rihanna, and thank you to all of our speakers. I am now about to open up the debate to the floor, and this will last for around 15 minutes. I'm going to invite speakers from the floor to raise points in relation to the debate, and if you would like to contribute, then please raise your hand. If you're selected, then you should wait for the red light to come on and the microphone in front of you. Stand up, tell the chamber your name and the name of your school before you raise your point. That is, if you're able to stand up. If you're not able to stand up, then you can remain seated. Contributions should be short, because then I can hopefully try and fit as many in as possible who want to contribute. 
Uh, teams can choose to respond to the point, but their performance is not judged against their response, or teams can simply choose to concentrate on reply speeches which are marked. There is going to be a £50 book token for the best floor speech of the evening. And so I will now ask uh, our timekeeper to start the clock and I will monitor for 15 minutes. Thank you. Show of hands, please, for anyone who wishes to contribute. OK. Young man at the back. <coughs> Could we have oh, the microphone? Go. Thank um, you. So the legislation is current form that sort of removes people's right to access the press media in this, or sort of removes the press media's right to cover this, these events, will push people onto social media, which is unregulated, full of infatu uh, sort of embellishment and exaggeration. So you're taking people, people being informed on these matters from regulated media by Ofcom to people who to being moved onto social media that's totally unregulated and full of made-up opinion and extremist opinion. This is only going to damage the extremist uh, debate in this country even further by making a more misinformed population. Yes, thanks. Could I have your name, please, and oh, your school? Sorry. Uh, Daniel Craig and Robert Gordon's College. Thank you very much. Any other points? OK. Young man, second row here. Um, Anthony Walsh, Robert Gordon's College. Um, the second proposition speaker uh, touted the media, the, the menace of the media as being responsible for uh, racial inequality and racial tensions that have existed. But surely the uh, gentleman would agree that fundamentally the problem arises because those who choose to act under the banner of extremism and fundamentalism do so. And to embrace ignorance is no solution. Uh, surely he would agree that merely reporting the facts i.e. a terrorist attack, is what generates uh, the, the, the tension, as opposed to uh, any kind of bias or misreporting on the part of the media. OK, thank you. Can I just reiterate, if our teams do wish to respond, then they would have to catch my eye to do so, please. Can I see another show of hands? Yep. Young man here. Um, Callum Fairbairn, Falkirk High. Uh, the proposition said there that, um, I would talk about the dangers um, that the media are reporting on terrorist events is having, but they then said that they would allow this to go on unhindered via social media and the internet. Surely in the modern world, where the vast majority of people have Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, all sorts of social media, it's pointless to say the media cannot report things, um, but it can continue unhindered on social media. Okay, thank you very much. And behind, the young man behind. Uh, Jason Woods, Clifton Hall School. So. Um, the proposition, mainly the second speaker, talked a lot about the fear and why this is a reason that we should restrict media coverage. But uh, a lack of information would increase fear, as people fear what they don't know. So having everything out in the open and having everything be more transparent would be a better remedy for the fear than trying to stage a cover-up over details uh, in order to stop sensationalism, as in a balanced farms, the well-being of our citizens, to not have them living in fear is far more important than any risk of terrorists being regarded as martyrs. Thank you very much. If I could have another show of hands, I'm a bit concerned about the gender balance this evening. Uh, young woman. Uh, Neve McPherson from Dunfermline High School. Um, the point on social media has been touched on um, uh, briefly by the proposition there. Um, and we all know how unreliable uh, places like Facebook and Twitter can be. And surely uh, a lack of information from reliable sources such as the BBC um, would, can cause people to look online for uh, more of these sources, which might be false. And surely that would have the opposite effect of trying to calm people down. It could uh, encourage more sort of uh, wild and over-enthusiastic reports that people online could have, have posted. Thank you. Many thanks. Yep. Young man in the middle. Alexander McLaren, St Mary's Music School. In a world where national security is far from transparent, we have GCHQ and the American Never Say Anything, the NSA. Uh, surely a government which pretends that it's being transparent about issues of national security is entirely hypocritical in pretending that it's giving everybody the information that is there. Thank you for your contribution. 
Can I see some more hands, please? Young woman right at the back. Um, Linda Nixon, Robert Gordon's College. Um, there was a point, sorry, there was the point made about radicalisation earlier in the debate, and um, I thought that the, um, the, this point was raised by the proposition, who said that social media and internet are often causes of, um, causes of radicalisation. They sort of encourage young people, especially, to become radicalised. However, I feel that this was not really addressed under the definition and the, the, and the mech of the motion. Social media would not be restricted in any way and would perhaps be used um, more as a form of media as the legitimate media would, ha would be restricted. So people would turn to social media more. So that I feel that if, this, um, if we accept the premise that radicalisation comes from social media and internet, surely that this problem would then be worsened by the motion. Many thanks. Um, young man here. Thank you. Thank you. Lewis Clofton, from High School. Um, surely this information you're limiting the media to, the basic facts, people want to know more than that. They want to know how it happened, who happened, and they want, they're looking in the line for us, and people will start rumours, there will be incorrect facts put out. People will start to get fearful over the stuff they don't know and the facts that are not actually true that have been put out to them. They'll grow more afraid of the lies than of the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, young woman three back, I think, if you want to get on your feet. Yep. Um, Caitlin Browning, Lanark Grammar. Um, would younger children not go looking for information such as myself or, as another person has pointed out, make up rumours on social sites such as um, guessing what has happened or guessing information or guessing who has done it? And such as um, pointing out religions, would young children not be offended by um, people targeting certain religions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, gentleman at the back here. Hello, I'm Callum Bell from Hill Park Secondary School. I'd just like to say you can restrict larger media companies from covering certain terrorist attacks, but you can't restrict uh, individual reporters from going and covering these events. So all you're doing is discouraging competition with these uh, events, and you're just going to People get wise to this and they'll just be pushed towards uh, smaller, more independent media sites. So it's not really going to do anything. Thanks. Thank you very much for your contribution. And young man in the middle. The second proper... Stuart Wood, Lanark Grammar people. The second proposition said that Muslims have started fear due to the media co showing coverage of terrorist attacks. But... Saying this isn't it implying that all Muslims are terrorists, as he didn't say certain part groups of Muslims and just plain Muslims. Thank you very much. Um, yep, yeah, young woman here. Uh, Sophie Miller, Lanark Grammar. Um, the proposition both said that um, terrorism is current, but surely the role of the media is to report what's current in detail. Thank you. And behind you. Um, I think we can all agree that radicalisation and extremist uh, and extremism in social media strikes fear into the public, as well as the fact that the unknown strikes fear in, into, into the public. So, by restricting the media, surely aren't you just um, aren't you just increasing the amount of radicalisation and extremis, extremism on the social media, as well as increasing the amount of unknown in the public, therefore creating more fear in the country and benefiting the ter um, terrorists even more than it would with the media unrestricted. Thank you. Could I have your name and your school, please, young man? Hello. <laughs> um, Toby Appiar, Clifton Hall School. Many thanks. Um, I'll go back to this side of the room. Yep, in the middle. Yep. Hello, Adam McElroy from St Morris's High School. Now, I agree with the proposition on the point that, you know, the media and their reporting can sometimes uh, facilitate the racial hatred and in some ways exemplify it. But I don't think this is going to be fixed by restricting facts. I think this is going to be fixed more by removing the bias aspects of the media, such as newspapers like The Sun and The Daily Record, and having more unbiased media outlets like the BBC, which are trusted and regulated by government. I think that is the solution, not, as the proposition have put forward, restricting the facts. We have a response. What we're trying to do is make the system as unbiased as possible. You said that we're going to restrict facts. That's exactly what we're not restricting. We're restricting everything else, though, all the biased opinions. Thank you very much. Show of hands again. Young woman at the back here. Yep. 
Um, Breach Chaimba from St Mary's Music School. Is it not possible that more media coverage would force terrorists into hiding, making it more difficult to arrest them rather than easier for the public to identify them? Thank you very much. And young woman here, please. Heather Henderson, Falkirk High School. I feel that it's still unclear as if you are going to criminalise victims for speaking to media outlets um, from the proposition. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, young woman at the back. Harriet Foreman, Robert Gordon's College. I would just like to address a point made by proposition, which was the idea that it's media bias which leads to kind of racial hatred and then reprisal attacks. And I actually feel that it's actually the opposite, that if we restrict what our media can say, what we get is half-truths and scaremongering, and that's far more dangerous than people kind of airing their views in an open and kind of more legitimate means, rather than kind of all this kind of the conjecture stuff, which actually I feel will be far more dangerous. Many thanks. And young man here. Uh, Luke, from, Luke McPhee from St Morris's High School. Uh, it seems clear that the opposition wish not to restrict the victims, uh, whilst the proposition wish to censor certain aspects of the incident, such as the name of the terrorist group. This would therefore mean that the victims shall not be limited and will be able to tell their story, yet the terrorists shall not be named, preventing one of their main motives. Surely this is a good thing. Thank you. And I'll go to the gentleman behind you. Uh, hi, Jeremy Juan, Dunfermline High School. Um, one of the things that the proposition was suggesting was to only profess the need to know details in the media. Now, I think one of the good points of the opposition was the positive aspects that media coverage and full profession of the inter information available could have, in the sense that the example given was with the Boston bombings, where by giving the identities of the, um, of the suspects, in fact, they were able to be caught and reprimanded for what they did. Now, I think if you limit it to need-to-know information, then you kind of lose that positive aspect. Many thanks. Gentleman here. Yep. Uh, Murray Marnock from Presk Academy. One thing that I've noticed, and I'm sure everybody in this room has noticed at some point in their lives, since 9-11 has happened. Islamophobia is a thing. It is growing and growing and growing. The news is projecting it, as many have said, a lot of terrorist attacks have not actually been by Islam people, right? But the, the media itself is projecting it as if it is. So surely then, by limiting what you can say on the news, you're actually going to cause more problems because people are going to instantly assume it was Islam's, because that theory is already there in a lot of the country's minds. Surely by, rather than not allowing people in the country to know what's happened, you tell them more, you maybe not make it about race, but you make sure that the country is aware that it is not just the small minority of a religion and this entire religion getting the blame. That's all. Many thanks. We've just got a couple of minutes left, so I'll see another couple of speakers, but remember that you get a chance later. Young woman. Uh, Mehek Chowdhury, Dunfermline High School. I think we'll all agree that terrorists commit acts in order to get a message across to the people, mainly a message to strike fear into the public. Um, the restriction of the media coverage will block these messages, and there will no longer be any point in committing acts of terror. And I know this won't completely stop terrorist attacks, but it has the potential to stop many that are already happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, young woman in the middle. Uh, Rachel Murray, Lanark Grammar School. Um, I'd just like to point out that due to these restrictions, uh, there would obviously be less coverage of terrorist attacks in the media. Um, that is the point, and therefore they would have less impact. And I'd like to suggest that this would in fact cause a surge in terrorism in order to counteract this, making attacks more likely and putting innocent lives at risk, in fact, you know, removing any point that the proposition may have had. Thank you. Thank you. And young man behind. Yep. Um, Fraser Taylor, Clifton Hall School. Um, do you not think um, that because you are sort of you aren't focusing on the race in the 
um, in the news or whatever, you're still um, sort of isolating races and people still live in fear of those races. And the opposition also said that they concentrate on the fact that heroes are like sort of born on the fact of the media covering the the terrorist attacks in detail. Do you not think that would still happen if it wasn't like in so much detail? People would still do it because it's human nature to try and help. Okay, thank you all very much for your contributions in this section. We will be coming back to another open debate section, so please keep your points for, for then. Um, I'm now going to ask Rachel Miller to reply on behalf of the opposition. And Rachel, you have three minutes, please. Okay. So firstly, I would like to highlight some issues that we have found with the proposition's um, arguments tonight. So, firstly, they have admitted to planning on restricting victims' coverage and seem to feel that they have the supreme knowledge and the right to decide what is best for victims. What gives the proposition this right? Surely it is up to the victims to decide whether or not they want to go and talk to someone or if they want to share their experiences with the media. And often a lot of victims may feel that they are having some kind of closure by sharing their experiences with the mainstream media or by the fact that they can raise awareness. And they can't do that through social media to the same extent as they could with the more respected, as you said, media outlets. Um, so we feel that it is not up to the proposition to decide what is best for victims and what victims can and cannot do. In the same way that it is not up to them what um, is appropriate for the public to hear and see and what is appropriate for the public to know. We feel that the general public should have the right to choose what they know. So if, like I said... Corporations like the BBC are companies. So if people are unhappy with what they hear in the media, they can complain, and that will change to suit people. Under this motion, people will not have the right to decide whether or not they want to hear more about terrorism. And I suspect that given the impact of terrorism on society, people would want to see as much of terrorism as they could and have as much information as possible. Furthermore... Um, when you restrict coverage, there is no accountability. So like I said, we can currently complain if we feel that coverage has been inappropriate, but when it's censored, we don't know what has happened and that we haven't seen, which I also think would create more fear um, in contrast with what the proposition have said. Indeed, they have talked a lot about how the media causes fear. Does it? They haven't actually explained how the media causes fear, only asserted that it does. I would suggest that it's because it doesn't create fear. Indeed, as we stated, it leads to coverage of positive stories of humanity, the charities, the rallies of support, the, acts of heroic, uh, the heroic acts of the public. This is what we see, and it's, the media doesn't really focus on the act as much as the people. So I think that creates less fear than people imagining what may or may not have happened. Furthermore, they talked about um, how the media leads to radicalisation. Firstly, I would suggest that there are many other social factors which lead to radicalisation, and the media is simply an easy target. However, if we are to assume that the media is the fundamental cause, which I would dispute, I think that we would all agree that social media is the cause of radicalisation, not the BBC. Furthermore, um, they spoke of how the media lead to racism. I think this is naive and untrue, frankly. If you're racist, you're going to be racist with or without media. It's due to an individual's own ignorance and inadequacies if they're going to have racist views. I think that we should tackle racism in this country, but I don't think the media is to be blamed, and I don't think the proposition have actually said how it does please, please. Um, cause racism. So for all of the reasons highlighted tonight, I would urge you to support the opposition. Thank you. Many thanks, Rachel. Can I now invite Richard Montgomery to reply for the proposition? Three minutes, please, Richard. Thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen. Before this discussion draws to a close, I must remind you of what the true concerns have been this evening. Yes, this debate has been about censorship and media coverage. Yes, it has, to a certain extent, been about freedom of speech. But at the heart of it, it goes much deeper than that. This is about national security. This is about the vulnerable and marginalised and quite literally about life and death. Now, the word victims has been used quite a lot this evening, but what I want to ask just now is, who are the victims? 
Well, the victims are the people who have been invo involved in these horrific events, but the victims are also you and I. The victims are the vulnerable people in this society, the people who, in the aftermath, and this aftermath which the opposition has been so concerned about, who will then suffer as a result of irresponsible media coverage. Also in this debate, there seems to be a sort of opposition between prevention and cure. As the proposition, we are far more interested in, prevented these, in preventing these acts from occurring in the first place, which is why we've talked about the oxygen of publicity which the mainstream media provides for these terrorists. The opposition has been very concerned about the aftermath of the events and allowing victims to express themselves and saying that we as proposition are restricting their freedom of speech. We are not. We, are, we wish to keep our people safe, the vulnerable, the marginalised, you and I, as well as the people involved in these horrific events. We do not want to restrict democracy. And remember, democracy is a means, not an ends. Democracy, democracy is the system our government chooses to keep us safe. Remember, the primary role of our government is to keep us safe. That's what Anna reminded us at the beginning of this uh, debate. And it's what I want to reinforce as we close tonight. Final minute. If we wish to cultivate that safer environment, we must prune back the tangled mess that we have allowed the media's coverage of the atrocities to become. It's the fact that it is so uncontrolled. That is what is creating fear. We, as vulnerable people, and we are all vulnerable, are not responsible enough to choose what to be influenced by. It's on the BBC, therefore it frightens us. As we have shown, our proposed restrictions will reduce the risk of terrorism itself. That's where our prevention idea comes in, as well as allowing our nation to achieve greater equality and operate as a fairer society. And that is curing us all of great evils in our own country. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention this evening. Good night. Thank you very much to both teams and to those who contributed from the floor to the debate. We've had some really interesting contributions and I hope that you all enjoyed participating here in the Scottish Parliament this evening. There's going to be a short break uh, before I announce that. Can I also just take time to thank Willie Rennie, MSP, and Roderick Campbell, MSP, who have also taken time out of their busy schedules to come and join us for the debate this evening. So, I think we're grateful to them for joining us too. Thank you both. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, during the break, could you please speak to an event assistant if you wish to make use of this time to use the facilities? And uh, could I ask the speakers from St Mary's Music School and Lanark Grammar to move your seats, please, into the row behind, and we will then welcome back Madras College and Presswick Academy for the second debate. Can I ask everyone to be seated again to commence promptly at 7.51? Thank you very much. Ten-minute break.
Right, thank you all. I heard a hush descending on the assembled crowd there, so that's good. Welcome back, everyone. So, before we start the second uh, debate of the evening, I want to remind everyone of the motion again. This House would restrict media coverage of terrorist attacks. And we will start the second debate by calling on Jamie McLeod from Madras College to open this debate as the first proposition speaker. Jamie, six minutes, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Presiding Officer. And the motion tonight is this House would restrict media coverage of terrorist attacks. And we tonight are arguing for the complete prohibition of private media sources in the UK from having any coverage of any kind of any terrorist attack on the Western world. Now, I'd like to go through this motion word by word and put my definition on each, because I think it's really important for this debate that there are no grey areas. Restrict, as I've said, the complete prohibition of private media sources. By media coverage, we're talking about apps, newspapers, websites, the private media's Twitter and Facebook accounts will also be prohibited from reporting. Now, the only media outlet with the ability to report will the BBC, and I have two very simple reasons for that. Firstly, they're not motivated by profit. They're required by its charter, by law, to provide a higher quality report as they can. And secondly, unlike newspapers such as The Times and Guardian, with their biased political agenda and very aggressive sales policy, the BBC espouses neutrality and fairness, thereby making it the most transparent source of information available to the public. Now, let me be clear here, no thank you. A, a profit-ridden private press can never aspire to these ideals of a publicly owned company. Instead, feeding off a burgeoning appetite for the dramatic, the elaborate, the hyperbolic, the hype and exaggeration, which satisfies not the hunger for truth, but the appetite for terror. And tonight I'm going to be focusing on why it's beneficial for the country, I'll take in a second, why it's beneficial for the country following an attack of terror that the BBC are reporting, and how in doing so we enhance the information available to the public. David. Um, surely sometimes it can be good for <coughs> a bit of an an extreme response to terrorism because it shows the people how bad the situation is and how much needs to be done to tackle it. Okay, let me be absolutely clear here. We're not saying that we should filter out any passioned, any, any angered responses to terrorism. What we're saying is the way in which it's doing it now, where we have it in private media, where the debate that takes place is often, by the way, very... It's not credible at all because the facts are undermined because the newspapers want to exploit the other side. For example, the Times, their agenda is to attack the other side. That would be the left. And the left, the Guardian, their aim is to attack the other side, that's the right. So what I want to say to you there is the debate that you talk about isn't credible at all, because what it is are the facts being undermined um, and unfortunately confusing the public as a result. Now I'm then going to focus on the issues... No, thank you, David. Secondly, I'll be addressing the issues of dramatisation in private media, which bridges you in in my case as he goes on to more closely examine radicalisation and where exactly it stems from. Now, before I move on to my substantive case tonight, um, presiding officer, let me first suggest to directly address the two main criticisms of what we're proposing tonight and how we on side per position win on each point. And we're going to hear a lot from the other side of the chamber about how our motion limits the free press. But I have one very simple point in response to this. Firstly, I question the very existence of a free press when we have The Sun, read mostly by the lower economic groups, and Times, read mostly by the higher economic groups, owned by one and the same man. I've not even mentioned Sky, again owned by Murdoch, who has a very dangerous amount of influence over almost every demographic in our society. But let's say for a second that there is a free press. And I make no bones about this. We are happy and proud to stand up tonight and say we're going to limit it because it is in the national interest to do so, and I go on to prove that in my case tonight. Further, we might also get this idea that we are limiting information to the public, and I've responded to this in a point of information. And this brings me on to my first point tonight, ladies and gentlemen, and that's accessibility of information to the public. Lord Speaker, let me tell you that it is they on that side of the chamber who are limiting information, as under the status quo, where we have hundreds of headlines reporting what feels like all day, every day, using very confusing and conflicting headlines. And if you take that fact and you couple it with the dramatisation of the facts that, to make sales, and don't let's forget that that's what private media aims to do, make sales, and they make those sales by tapping into the paranoia that exists in our country. And we are a very paranoid country. For example, in 2012, the London Underground Twitter feed was hacked. And the hackers said that they'd found a bomb on one of the cars. Now, of course, very quickly, the, the, the hackers were proven completely wrong. The police came out and said that that was completely false. But still, as a result, the London Underground was boycotted for a, a period of two weeks. Because we're a very paranoid nation. And these private media companies, they know that. They tap into that. That's how they make their sales. And let's be frank here. When we create that hype, that exaggeration, that panic that takes place when we have those perpetuating headlines. The terrorists, they don't care how many people die, they care about the response. 
that hype that's created, that terror that we get as a result. And every single time we see that headline, it's a victory for them. We tonight, no thank you, David. We tonight under this motion are enhancing the information. We're centralizing the necessary info, streamlining it to a credible, concise source. Meaning that the public, they don't have to sift through every headline. The information is available to them, for them. Secondly, I'll be focusing on the dramatization that takes place in private media. Private media is motivated by profit. They're there to sell a story. And all good stories, I'll take you in a second, and all good stories need compelling characters. David, fire away. Final minute. Okay, thank you. I'll let you in if you want. All right. Um, when well, you say that about uh, private media wanting viewers and that's uh, how it's bad that we need to restrict them, but in this day and age, that is some people even debating whether the BBC should get the licence fee, so they need to justify that by getting viewers. Surely the BBC ju has just as much an interest in creating panic to get viewers as does the private media, regardless of what yeah. its charter okay, says. Okay, yeah, thank you for your point there. What I would say is you're talking about your licence fee, you're talking about funding to the BBC. The very sector of the BBC that is safeguarded is the news and the reporting. If any, if any cut were to be made, that would come in the entertainment sector, okay? and the BBC is safeguarded in its reporting. Um, and I'm going to go on now to talk about the dramatisation. They're there to sell a story. That's a fact. They talk about, they, and all good stories need compelling characters. Media exaggeration leads to radicalisation because they make characters out of terrorists. Characters that are larger than life, more menacing, more iconic than they would otherwise be. And this can be seen in the media coverage of Mohammed Amwazi. Chances are you don't know him. Mind up, please. Thank you. You know him as Jihadi John. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. The media painting a picture for profit, not telling you the facts, telling you what they want you to hear to make a story, to make a sale. Hype, exaggeration and panic are the sales model for private media. That creates a devastating impact on our society and gives a victory to the terrorists. Our motion enhances information and creates a stronger, more stable response to terrorism. Beg to propose. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jamie. Could I now invite David Cameron from Presswick Academy to respond as the first opposition speaker. David, six minutes, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Presiding Officer, esteemed judges. For decades now, and particularly since the September 11 Trade Centre bombings, reports of terror or the risk of terror have been ubiquitous in global mass media. We would define this motion as attempting to severely restrict the reporting of terrorist attacks or their perpetrators by any reasonable means, including censoring television, print media, the internet and radio. While we agree with the supporters of the motion that the terrorism portrayed in the media is unspeakably violent and inhumane and that the current portrayal of terrorism in the media leaves much to be desired, we simply do not agree with their premise that a severe restriction on reporting terrorist attacks would yield any benefit. I will put forward our case for allowing media reporting of such events, my colleague here will explain why restricting such reporting will not have the effects the supporters of the motion hope for. We believe that One it would be naive, immoral and impractical to adopt a head-in-the-sand approach to this issue, hoping that simply ignoring the atrocities committed by the terrorists will make them give up and go home. Terrorism was first recorded in Roman-occupied Judea in 1st century BC and has been used as a tactic to achieve one's aims since well before the dawn of mass media. So the media can't be blamed for its existence. Ignoring the terrorists will instead mean that knowledge no, thank you, of their atrocities will be far less available to the wider world, stifling international outrage that sparks movements like the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, which led to 200 girls in Nigeria being released safely. Such movements would not exist without the exposure media attention brings. Yes true the Bring Back Our Girls campaign took off on Twitter and on Facebook, both of which would be happening under our motion? Well, as you said, your restriction does include social media, including Twitter and Facebook. This led to over 200 girls being released safely, and this wouldn't happen without the exposure media attention brings. One could even argue that an increase in the right kind of exposure of terrorism could lead to fewer recruits for terrorist organisations. Western recruits for ISIS have had a far more sheltered life than the militants. So showing the reality of the situation on the ground would perhaps discourage them from giving up their comfortable lifestyle here. Repression, even if it is only imagined, breeds resentment. So censoring the media more could lead to more young Muslims feeling as if the West is against them, so giving ISIS more recruits again. Reporting of terrorist attacks also pressurises governments, 
that have not taken the necessary precautions to protect our citizens from terrorism. While we agree that the media has been far too alarmist or even sensationalist in their coverage of these attacks, and that they don't stress the underlying personal and political complexities of the situations, it's still better than having the public live in a bubble of ignorance, completely unaware of these atrocities. Yes. We're aware of these atrocities because what we're doing is enhancing information. Currently, you're proponents of this very conflicting and confusing way of putting it about. We say let's streamline it, concise, consource to a credible source, like the BBC. Well, your full proposition is the censorship of the media. You didn't say anything about the streamlining. We want to change the way it's talked about, not necessarily totally censoring it. The wider public knowledge of the Holocaust led to strong support for multilateral organisations such as the European Court of Human Rights, the United Nations and the European Union that are dedicated to defending peace and human rights. Unlike the supporters of the motion, we believe that the public have a right to be informed. It is simply part of the onward march of history that people know more about events happening halfway across the globe. And any attempt to stop this is futile. Anyone who wish to find out about these events will do so regardless of our efforts to stop them, but they would get their information through the prism of extremist underground websites and agent provocateurs acting on social media, downplaying the horror of these attacks and spreading their insidious message of hate, unchallenged and unchecked by a though imperfect moderate mainstream media. It is also important to consider the long-term implications of these restrictions, presumably individual governments or a UN agency would be responsible for implementing these restrictions, raising all sorts of issues around democratic accountability and censorship. I mean, who decides what is classed as terrorism in this sense? Power corrupts, and regardless of any potential safeguards in place, the power to censor the entire world's media would lead to abuses, as we have already seen on a, on a lesser scale across the globe, with authoritarian governments thwarting legitimate political expression in the name of stopping the terrorists. No, Final minute. The Chinese government has already used this excuse to oppress the Muslim minority in their country when, for example, in 2009, hundreds of Muslims were shot dead in their capital as an excuse for stopping terrorism. Imagine what any individual who is just as unscrupulous could do with even more power. This is a slippery slope, ladies and gentlemen, that could lead to the Orwellian nightmare of mass censorship. Stopping any one institution from having such power will help maintain our cherished liberal democracy. Stopping the enemy going from being extremists, willing to use violence to being our own dictatorial governments is reason in itself to oppose this motion, along with everything else I have mentioned, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, David. Can I now invite Ewan Redpath, second proposition speaker, to give us his views, please, Ewan, six minutes. Ladies, gentlemen, presiding officer, there are few things more dangerous to civil society than terrorist attacks. But one of them, one of the most heartbreaking, is the stream of vulnerable young people being lured away from this country to Iraq and Syria by Islamic State. And so it is not just for our own safety that we must try and prevent radicalization, but for their safety and their futures too. Hype, exaggeration and panic are the private media's sales model. And so we cannot expect them to act uh, responsibly when it comes to reporting terrorism. My partner has already shown several ways in which the hype and exaggeration of terrorism damages our country and aids terrorists. Now I will show how it creates two ex different extremist groups in our country. Firstly, radical Islam, and secondly, anti-Islamic radicals. First though, some rebuttal. So throughout the uh, opposition speaker's speech, we had this idea that we were somehow limiting information, restricting it to the point that people simply wouldn't know about terrorist atrocities. One minute. But as my partner has explained, we are um, streamlining this information to make it clear and concise. We're removing it from the hands of people like Rupert Murdoch and newspapers who only seek to confirm their readership's bias. They're there to they push towards an extreme because they know that is what sells papers. Um, so by, create, by bringing it into the hands of the, BBC, of the BBC, which is renowned throughout the world as being independent, fair and neutral on issues, we, create, we make it um, clear uh, and streamlined and easier for people to um, grasp, comprehend and understand the issue of terrorism clearly. 
Uh, no, thank you. So, to that first group, that uh, the hype exaggeration of terrorism creates radical Islam. In his second point, my partner described how the private media coverage uh, grants terrorists a perverse kind of celebrity. It is this sense of fame and reward that leads to radicalization. Imagine a young Muslim at risk of being radicalized. They are unsure of the society in which they live and, and dissatisfied with the future that the inner city has to offer them. They are stranded with a conflicted identity, separated from their grandparents' origins, but not entirely at ease in a society which often sees them as outsiders. And then all around them, on every newspaper, on every news channel, they see a strong identity just waiting for them. Black flags, a uniform, jihadi John, and all. To those stranded, an identity such as this can prove very alluring. Yes, please. Uh, you, you mentioned that seeing these things in the media helps these young people want to join them. But the government's own task force called, uh, I think it was Prevent, they, did a, they, they worked out that the main reasons people join these organisations are, like you said, social exclusion and isolation. But they get their information uh, about ISIS mainly from people on social media. So you would have to censor that to, uh, you know, for your motion to work, not simply the, the mainstream press. As you said, the reporting of terrorism is ubiquitous in our society, and we see that as the catalyst, as the first step towards this radical radicalisation. Um, so it's this perverse kind of celebrity, um, that, and it comes entirely from the perceived reaction to terrorist attacks, the reaction that is seen on the news, in newspapers, and is taken to be society's reaction. If that perceived reaction is panic, then the terrorists have a victory. And who doesn't want to be on the winning side? Private media reports compete with each other to make us revile Jihadi John, and yet they make those vulnerable to radicalization revere him. They allow him to be, them to be lured um, to a life of terrorism in the desert in Iraq and Syria. So by removing private media hysteria and exaggeration, um, we can stop this process. We can save these vulnerable young people. So to that second group that private media hype and exaggeration creates, anti-Islamic radicals. Private media reports on terrorism are there to provoke a heightened emotional response, because that is what sells. They are there to outdo each other in emphasizing the barbarity of the terrorist and the horror of the attack, because subtlety and nuance don't outsell striking headlines. But it is precisely at times such as after a terrorist attack that sobriety and reason are needed most, not rash decisions driven by emotion. No, thank you. A reasoned examination of the evidence would lead anyone to believe that terrorists do not represent the vast majority of Muslims and that burning down a mosque is no way to combat extremism. Yet the emotional response of a significant uninformed section of British society is violent anger. In the heat of communal rage, blaming outsiders becomes natural and burning down a mosque can seem a civic duty. By creating a heightened emotional response, the media drives and enables this violence. This can be seen clearly in the events following the murder of Lee Rigby on the streets of London. There was a graphic video of one of the killers immediately after the attack, his hands bloodied, um, justifying what he had just done. And it was shown by every major broadcaster. It was put on every front page the next day. It was turned into a spectacle. And what did this achieve? 200 attacks on Muslims in the following days and 10 attacks on mosques. In Essex, a man ran into a mosque brandishing two knives, throwing a gas canister into the congregation. In Grimsby, petrol bombs were thrown into, the, into a mosque. And in Woolwich, where the attack took place, an Islamic cultural center was burned to the ground. And there, on the charred ruins, newly spray painted with three letters, E-D-L. Ladies and gentlemen, that center was used by school children. Can you imagine the feelings of injustice, of vulnerability, and of incomprehension the attack created in there? Radical Islam and anti-Islam feed off each other, and the private media coverage and hysteria feeds them both. Because they are, those are exactly the feelings in which radical, radicalization thrives. Vulnerability, injustice, and incomprehension. Tonight, my partner and I have shown that private media, with its lust for sales, its aggrandizing and dramatizing of terrorism, and its exploitation of our paranoid mindset, does, it, does society extreme damage? Our motion tonight is about responsibility to society and responsibility to the vulnerable. We, mu we must not fail to act upon that. Thank you. Many thanks, Ewan. Can I now ask David Laird, second opposition speaker, to address us. David, six minutes, please. 
Mr Chair, esteemed judge, no, excuse me, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, esteemed judges, ladies and gentlemen, my colleague has already discussed the positive case for media freedom, and I will be discussing how enacting the restrictions that the supporters of the motion propose would be futile. But firstly, let me take issue with some of the, uh, <clears throat> the points made by the speakers for the motion. They have said that uh, through their motion that the public would still get as much information, it would just be streamlined through better sources. But the simple fact is, well, it is admirable to think, hope that it would be streamlined. The fact is that you can only streamline so much, there will be less information coming through less channels, so people will have less knowledge. <clears throat> also, uh, they, they mentioned about the reasons that young Muslims can be radicalised, saying that this is often because of reporting in the media. But the fact is that it has been proven, as I mentioned in my point of information, One minute. that Muslims are radicalised because... Yes? I picked up on something you said. Less sources and the, like, less physical amount of information does not equate to less knowledge. The greater clarity of the information that our motion would provide would lead to greater understanding of the issues surrounding terrorism and therefore greater knowledge in the, in the British population. Well, I understand the point you're trying to make, but the point is just that if there, are few, there will be less information circling and circulating. And secondly, just because you put it on the BBC doesn't mean that everybody's going to watch it. The fact is these people that read the sun or whatever, pay, instead of, and maybe don't watch the news, they're not going to suddenly start watching the news simply because coverage of terrorism is in newspapers. That's not why people read it. Anyway, back to my, my point. Muslims aren't radical, young Muslims aren't radicalised because of what they see in the media. It's social exclusion and isolation. A government task force found this also to do with, with social class. And the main way that these people are uh, contacted is through almost sleeper cells on social media telling them to come and join ISIS or to carry out this attack. That's what needs to be tackled. It needs to be a battle for hearts and minds, not just a simplistic measure. Yes. In second, going to stand here and claim that radicalisation is caused exactly just by, <coughs> by the private media reporting. What we're saying quite clearly is that it's the first domino in that trail. And if you can tackle that first domino, you have a much better footing in tackling radicalisation as a whole. Well, again, I, I don't understand the point you're trying to make, but the other thing that we're arguing, one of our main points, is that it's about changing the way that terrorism is discussed in the media. Now, that doesn't mean changing the reporting of terrorism. It's changing how it's discussed. Simply censoring things doesn't achieve that. Also, you also mentioned how this no, thank you, uh, can mean that Muslims, you know, people are racist towards them in our society because of the coverage of terrorism. But surely, I mean, it's obvious, the main reason for that is because of, whether you agree with it or not, there have been very, very fast changes in our society with mass immigration and, and, multi, and multiculturalism. That's what's making people fear Muslims. They've done it for the, all of time. People fear immigrants. They feared the Irish in Scotland at one point. Now they're integrated. It's not the media. It's simply human nature. But now, <clears throat> on to more of my own points. Many argue that media coverage of terrorism creates a public forum for those carrying out the attacks and that restricting this will make the perpetrators stardom fade into obscurity. But we've seen already the impotence of well-meaning yet misguided action of severely restricting the coverage of terrorism. Gerry Adams, leader of Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA, his voice wasn't allowed to be shown on television or radio, but this led to voice actors simply reading out what he'd said. This, the absurdity of this arbitrary restriction simply gave the IRA more publicity allowing them to portray themselves as oppressed freedom fighters. The terrorists that we have today would be able to do the same thing. They long for martyrdom of any sort. Let's not do things their way and give them what they want. It's also been proclaimed by many that since the object of terrorism... Uh, yeah. But you're, um, the private media gives them exactly what they want. They put these images, the image of a jihadi John beheading a terrorist, out there. That's exactly what the terrorists want. Well, again, that's the issue of how it's talked about, not how... You know, not the fact that they show the uh, jihadi John or the terrorism. It's the way they talk about it, and simply censoring it doesn't help that. Also, uh, to claim that the object of terrorism is to create fear, that shown attacks will terrify the public into submission and caving into their demands. But the one thing that unites every fear is the universal human phobia, the fear of the unknown. The censorship proposed by the supporters of the motion would lead to less understanding, exactly the opposite of what we need for a calm, well-informed public. 
The public's mistrust and desire for restricting Final coverage minute. should be directed at, right, at media moguls and right-wing commentators that sensationalise terrorism and really craft the news agenda. Not the channels reporting of terrorism, it's the discussion of terrorism that is the issue. This is another point. The reasoning that media coverage indirectly leads to more terrorist attacks and more recruits simply does not hold true. The countries that have the most terrorism are those like Iraq, Afghanistan and Nigeria that have been destabilised by foreign invasion, occupation and colonisation. Incidentally, they also have a far more restricted press than we in the West do. If the supporters of the motion really wanted to lower the number of terrorist attacks worldwide rather than focusing on our tiny and, frankly, rather unaffected corner of the globe, they would support measures to stabilise these nations, not a reaction and a sticking plaster solution. There's also an argument that too much public pressure on the government can be a bad thing and that it leads with governments to negotiating with terrorists and caving into the demands. Come to a close, but please. This isn't fully true. It can lead governments to negotiate with terrorists, but surely that can be a, bad, a good thing. We should, in the words of President Kennedy, never negotiate out of fear, but never fear to negotiate. If increased public exposure means that even a few innocents get the chance to survive their ordeals at the hands of terrorists, and I believe that that is reason enough to support this motion, to oppose, sorry, this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, and thanks to all of the speakers in this part of the tournament. Again, of course, we've had some very interesting views in the debate, and I'm going to open up the debate to the floor and invite as many people as possible to participate. As before, it will be for 15 minutes. And uh, if you can raise points in relation to the debate, please. And if you want to speak, raise your hand. If selected, wait for the red light to come on. Please stand if you can. Tell the chamber your name and your school. Please try and remember that. It's important. And short contributions. Uh, teams can choose to answer the points if they wish, but the performance is not judged uh, against the response, or teams can simply concentrate on constructing their reply speeches, which is marked. So, can we start the clock for 15 minutes, please? Young man in the middle here, whose hand I saw got up first. Um, Callum Fairbairn, Falkirk High. Oh, no. The proposition said there they would like to restrict coverage of terrorist attacks to one organisation, BBC, was well, surely in a liberal country such as Britain that respects the fundamental human rights um, of freedom of speech, the government has no place deciding who can and cannot re report on important events such as terrorist attacks. Thank you. It was actually the young man behind. I, I would hope that those who have already had a chance would maybe not uh, put their hand up again until the end to see if we have some time. I'll try and give yep, yourself. Um, Anthony Walsh, Robert Gordon's College. Um, the proposition this evening has given us uh, two choices, two centralised uh, uh, extremes, two ju a juxtaposition. They said we can have commercial centralisation or state centralisation of the media. Now, I, I put this question to them. Would they rather have the, what I can see to be greedy, but ultimately fickle, uh, ever-evolving and chameleon-like uh, commercial media that is designed to, to make money and not uh, establish and present a political position, or would they rather have state manipulation targeted in order to spread fear, in order to, uh, to, to, to fit an agenda, in order to, 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 to meet the needs of a government and establish uh, public support and fear as they so wish? Thank you very much. Please put your hand up if you've not contributed in the earlier open debate. If we have time, I'll try and take others at the end. Young man in the middle. Uh, Kai Skier, Presswick Academy. Uh, just for the, the supporters, uh, your proposal would severely curtail free speech and the freedom of press. Now, surely this brings us closer to the kind of society that these extremists would want. So why not just lay down the welcome map for ISIS and stop even pretending to oppose them? Thank you. Thank you very much. Right at the back, please. Yep. Sorry, I'll call you next. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to address a question to the uh, opposition. And uh, it was the first speaker who said that, me that we want to say that the media discourages terrorists by showing the reality of ISIS 
and show the, what the front lines are really like and discourage people from leaving their comfortable Western lives. But I'd say this is already the reality. We already, already have the free information. And what we're seeing now is every few weeks or so, young people, vulnerable people, leaving their comfortable Western lives to go and uh, join ISIS on the front lines. But we heard from the second uh, prop proposition speaker that what the media is doing is creating a, a picture, an identity for these vulnerable people to conform to. Well, I say, why don't we restrict this, this uh, identity? Why don't we restrict this glamorization of terrorism in the news to then create a more uh, fact-driven and ultimately a uh, more realistic picture of what's really going on in the front line and ultimately stop the corruption of our vulnerable young people in society? Thank you. Could Thank I have you. your name in school, please? Uh, Jake Walker, Madras College. Many thanks. And a young man in the second last row. Um, Alexander MacDonald, St Mary's Music School. Well, early on, the opposition had said uh, about social media like Facebook and Twitter, saying that uh, how it spreads, it's harder to control how the news spreads about terrorist attacks. Well, what you're saying is that how does it get out there in the first place? It must be some, high, uh, some very important news businesses, like including the BBC, CNN, and many other uh, newspapers, which include the news out there in the first place as soon as it happens. How are you supposed to do? You're supposed to restrict what they put out there so that it spreads very, very slowly. By only by people who had seen the actual event can can spread it out there on social media. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, young man at the back here, please. Thank you. Could I have the microphone? Um, I think different sources give different viewpoints on events and create a more engaged and informed public, and there's no real way around this. Uh, if you streamline a anything, uh, you, really you have to remove something. Uh, you can't preserve the sort of information and knowledge-rich atmosphere that we are lucky to have in Britain if there's only one source. Uh, indeed, the BBC originally uh, was sold to the government uh, as a way of putting propaganda out to the general public. Uh, there is no way of ensuring that the, the BBC will remain uh, in the interests of the public rather than the interests of the government. Could I have your name in school, please? Uh, Lawrence Brown, Madras College. Many thanks. And just along from you, I think someone else was leaping to their feet. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, Miles McClure from Madras College. Um, the opposition were saying how... Uh, if uh, we were streamlining, as the proposition said, uh, what they were giving out to the public, then we would be giving less information, and meaning that the public knows less and has less to deal with. Uh, however, this is not true, because if we were streamlining what the people hear, then we would be cutting out what crazy people say and their opinions... Uh, and leaving it up to the public to decide for themselves and discuss among themselves the correct way of looking at it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, young woman in the middle here. Hazel Sully, St Morris High School. Uh, the opposition first speaker said that to propose this motion would be to hope that ignoring terrorists in the media would, to directly quote the speaker, make them give up and go home. And this is something which the first opposition speaker believes would be unsuccessful. However, terrorists thrive off of this media attention. Therefore, to ignore them in the media could lead to a decrease in the attacks. Many thanks. Uh, anyone at this side who hasn't spoken in the previous debate? Young woman here. Hi. Alice Jaspers, Robert Gordon's College. Surely the proposition's idea of using a neutral and informed platform as a, um, to report terrorist attacks, as opposed to having an assortment of biased and limited um, sources forcing their own agenda, is going to allow the public to form their own opinions as much as is possible in the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. And I'm looking in the middle. Uh, you haven't asked a question before? Oh. On you go. Um, Elan and in, in Lanark Grammar School. Um, how are you sure that shortening the public's information would reduce terrorism? Wouldn't it just make the terrorists do more horrible things to get more publicity and stand out? Thank, Thank you very much. And right at the back, please. Yep. 
Siobhan Meldrum, Madras College. The opposition touched on the fear derived from the unknown. In regards to terrorism, wouldn't you agree that the majority of fear leading to discrimination today is enhanced, if not created, by bias or uncredible sources, neither of which category the BBC falls into? Therefore, by limiting the public source of information to a level trusted media outlet, surely we'll have the general public more informed of the solid, credible facts and clarity thereof, reducing fear and discrimination derived from the source of the proposition wished to censor. Thanks. Thank you very much. And yes, young man here. Uh, Adam McGurr, St Morris's High School. Surely by streaming through one reliable source, i.e. the BBC, you would get the facts across that actually matter, um, rather than exaggerated lies um, through you know, the private media or social media. So you'll still get media coverage of terrorism, but it will be quite unbiased and untru uh, sorry, not untruthful. Truthful. Thank you. Looking in the middle again. Young woman. Yeah. Um, Sinwa Lawyer from Lanark Grammar and I would just like to point out that if you want like the BBC to take over every single aspect of terrorism news um, can they actually tackle everything all like I understand that they are a wide range of like reporters and journalists but they would have a lot of responsibility and nevertheless they may not be able to cover every aspect that the viewers the people want and even in schools, we use topics such as terrorism, like 9-11. We use them to gain our own information, to study and to comprehend as well, so that we can enhance our knowledge as well. But if you just like, put a lid on like, just for the BBC, then views will be stopped as well. So it's kind of putting a limit to what people say, what people think. Thank you very much. And I'll open it up again to those who have had the opportunity previously. Young man at the back who moved to seat. <laughs> we were told to, I promise. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the proposition of forgetting that many people have in fact lost faith in the BBC uh, with sex abuse scandals and cover-ups of prominent employees and accusations from across the political spectrum of political bias. Therefore, it seems absolutely laughable that we should give an organisation with such a shaky record on press coverage a, a monopoly on news. The proposition is genuinely proposing an Orwellian nightmare. Just remind us of your name in school oh, again. I, keep, I forgot that last time as well. Um, Daniel Craig, Robert Gordon's College. Should have remembered that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Young man in the middle. Jonathan Winston, uh, Press Academy to the Opposition. The first duty of any government is to defend its citizens from harm. Surely this includes the emotional harm that the footage of these attacks um, can cause. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, young man. Stuart Wood, Lanark Grammar Pupil. The first proposition speaker talked about the hackers lying about the... Ha Hackers lying on social media that there was a bomb on a carriage of an underground train. But what if this was true? Social media would have saved many lives. And this lie was not social media's fault. It was actually the hackers' fault who promoted um, the fear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, gentlemen. Well, gentlemen behind you. Yep. It Jason Woods, Clifton Hall School. So, like the the proposition mentioned that many of the current uh, uh, newspapers and stuff are profit driven, but I think we're often misjudging the agendas because people aren't only after profit; they have political agendas. And if you shut down their outlet, we're not we're going to take to social media or other forms to adapt, and they'll, with any means necessary, they'll further their uh, political agenda. So the problem's not going to go away. Thank you. I'm just going to ask again for anyone who's not had an opportunity, because we've only a few minutes left. Yep, young man. Uh, Andrew Peck from Press Academy. <clears throat> uh, the, the freedom of speech aspect has been uh, mentioned a couple of times as well as in the previous debate, but surely the reduction of the number of uh, media sources reduces the, 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 the amount of information that you can form proper opinions, which can be used in further debates on counter-terrorism measures. Thank you. Anyone else who's not had an opportunity? Yep. Young woman in the middle here. Um, Anna Kirkwood, Dunfermline High School. If we accept that the main aims of terrorists are to get a response and to create fear, then surely this proposition will be seen as terrorists by, as, a fear, as a fearful response and make them think that what they are doing is working 
and therefore encourage them to continue to commit atrocities. Thank you. And a young woman next to you. Yep. Um, surely the pressure on the BBC to report on every detail and meet the public's desire for knowledge would reduce their ability to report on other aspects of news and will turn them into like a round-the-clock terror channel. Could I have your name in school, please? Lee Tweed, I'm from the high school. Many thanks. Uh, yep, young man. Um, Ken Fairbrother, St Mary's Music School. Um, one of the points that the opposition has been making is free speech. And I think that rather than letting the terrorists show us their views, we should be letting the minorities who have the same social problems but don't have the same radical ideas to express their views on social media. OK, thanks. Another show of hands. Yeah, girl at the back, please. Um, we have to think about the effect of terrorism on young children. Um, surely if we limit um, media coverage, children would not grow up seeing horrific images of terrorism when they turn on the TV or see a newspaper lying around. Um, Sorry, your name in school? Ella Markham, Madras College. Thank you. And a young woman in front of you who thought it was her? Um, uh, Katie Grieve from Madras College. Um, the opposition said that no restrictions would lead to a calm, informed person, but surely this is the opposite of what would happen. Too much information would make people paranoid and make discrimination more frequent. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple more of anyone who hasn't had an opportunity. Young man. Um, Craig McCall, Lanark Grammar School. <clears throat> I just want to say that if the BBC is the respected, neutral form of media that the proposition portrayed it to be, then how come the media coverage already delivered isn't the streamlined coverage that you suggested? Thank you. And Thank you. someone who's not had a chance? OK, right at the back. Hi, I'm Isabel Grieve from Madras College. And I think that having less media coverage would prevent the manipulation of terrorist attack stories. If a member of the public came forward with an account of a terrorist attack, the media might manipulate and change the story to their benefit. Sure, if there were no limited media coverage, there would certainly be rumours, but people would know that these are rumours. If a story is in a well-known newspaper, whoever manipulated the story is, we would believe it. This surely causes more fear and is far more dangerous. Thank you. Thank you. Last contribution for someone who's not had an opportunity to speak at all this evening. No. OK, hands up those who have. Young man in the middle. Uh, Murray Marnock, Presque Academy again. Uh, the BBC has been given a lot of abuse over this debate, and I'm about to give it a little bit more. <laughs> uh, the whole point that you've said yourself, you, you see the BBC as a reputable source. I'm sorry, but in this room especially, the referendum, how much did the BBC slant towards one side? Let's be honest. Come on. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm interested, because I'm sure we all noticed that the BBC are very royalist, are very unionist. So you, you can't really put any one form of media to say, no, this is, the, this is the media we will use. We'll streamline this. This will be great. la di da di da The big problem you're going to have is all, these, all the different forms of media together can make a better overall grasp of a situation. You can't just say, no, we're going with this one. This is what we want to do. It's been around for a long time. They pick what they want to say, same as any media. But given all the media the equal right to be heard, to be read, to be seen, people can come to their own views. They can streamline it themselves. We're not idiots. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who's contributed for your fantastic contributions this evening. I'm now going to ask David Laird to reply on behalf of the opposition. David, you have three minutes, please. It was once said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither. That, in essence, sums up our opposition to this motion. What the supporters of the motion have failed to articulate throughout this evening's proceedings is how any concessions made any sacrifices of our freedoms endured, or any erosion of the independence of our media, will somehow make us safer from terrorism. What they are suggesting 
would mean that only the state they dress up as the BBC as being this perfect, unbiased institution. And while it may be better than other media platforms, the fact is, is it is a government-controlled media channel. You would put access to all information about this in the hands of the government. Now, that's starting to sound more and more like 1984 to me, along with the way that you've euphemistically used streamline to say give people less information. It is quite mind-boggling, actually, to say that giving less people information and knowledge is streamlining it. But this knee-jerk response of censorship and authoritarianism is exactly what the terrorists want. It will mean our citizens will live in ignorance, fear's most fertile breeding ground. The stereotyping of minorities as terrorists will not simply disappear, but will be exacerbated as the draconian response to this threat makes the populace disproportionately fearful and paranoid, just what the supporters of the motion say they want to stop. The public outrage that has so often brought justice to the victims of such attacks will be replaced by a bleak silence, as the people hear only whispers of the horror that exists outside of our little corner of peace, prosperity and proper justice. Instead, we have seen how the supporters of the motion propose a simplistic solution to a problem that goes back to a time long before television and radio. We have seen how the real issue <clears throat> It's not the showing of an execution here or a bombing here, but rather the way that the narrative of terrorism is framed by various people. And we don't agree that putting this into the hands of one institution, no matter how revered it is by us and by the people, and to patronise the people of this country by saying that they can't be trusted with knowledge because they might use it to stigmatise others, it's patronising. By telling the people that terrorism can be stopped, or at least combated by their proposal, they give false hope, and there can be no true despair without hope. This motion will inflict even more heartbreak and misery on the public after attacks, as their hopes that maybe, possibly, fewer people would take part in and carry out these attacks because of their motion doesn't happen. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, this debate boils down to one existential issue that has been with us since the dawn of complex societies. The conflict between our perceived collective security and individual liberty. Unlike the supporters of the motion, we believe that liberty is never a bad thing and there can never be too much of it. Join us in opposing the motion unless you are prepared for your rights, your freedoms and your liberty to be taken away. Join us in opposing this motion in the spirit of Patrick Henry, one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, when he cried out, give me liberty or give me death. Thank you very much, David. And can I now invite Jamie to reply for the proposition? Three minutes, please. Well, thank you very much again, um, Presiding Officer. This debate tonight is centralised around freedoms. The freedom to debate, the freedom of expression, the freedom of the press, the availability of information. And tonight, my, my, my summation is focusing on why we on this side of the House champion each and every single freedom that he mentioned across on that side of the House. Let me firstly address the freedom of information. Okay? We enhance it. We make information a lot more easily accessible for members of the public. Okay? Let's take the scenario that we've got right now, the status quo. What happens? You have hundreds of confusing and conflicting headlines put about by the agenda that is politically aggressive and is motivated by sales. That's not the kind of information I want to see in this country. That's not the kind of information I want people to receive about terrorist attacks. I want the kind of information that is credible that actually informs people. And Ewan mentioned in a POI, he said, uh, physical information, tangible information, does not equate to knowledge. And that couldn't be more true. We didn't really get a response from David, and it still stands. Because just because you have loads of bits of paper, that doesn't mean the public are going to be better informed. It doesn't mean they're going to better understand the real issues. But let me tell you how they're going to understand the real issues. Um, the BBC did get a lot of criticism tonight. But let's not forget people here. The BBC is the most neutral and the fairest source of information in the world. It is. You can't, if, if you look at the other sources, the Times, come on, that's not fair, that's not biased. It's politically aggressive, it's motivated by sales. The BBC is the most neutral and the fairest in the world. And I'm happy to stand here tonight, and I make no bones about this, to, uh, to defend that, because it is. We enhance information. We, in we put it into a credible source, and I'll take that and I'll defend it for the rest of this night. And that's why we went on that point, because we didn't get a response from you, and we enhanced that information. And the second point I want to talk about is freedom of debate. You know, let's think about the debate that takes place right now. 
the debate in private media where the facts are exploited and undermined to suit the agenda of whoever is on the other side. Whether it be the Final Times, minute. they're going to undermine the facts, they're going to exploit the facts because they want to take a slant against Labour. Just like The Guardian, they'll undermine the facts, they'll exploit, uh, exploit the main point to undermine the other side. Because that's the state of the debate in our country right now. Don't be under this illusion that we're completely free with our liberties, that the debate is strong and powerful. It's not. It influenced, it's influenced by the agenda of one man. That's Rupert Murdoch. He has a dangerous amount of influence over every demographic in this society. We want to pull that influence away from him and put it back in the public's hand and make sure that that debate is enhanced and is the best form that it can be. And I want to talk to you a little bit about, and we got this and I want to address directly the point that David Cameron made, and that's the idea of how do you stop terrorist attacks? How do you stop that happening? Well, I say this. Well, we start by stopping that first domino in the radicalisation trail. We say, let's stop people being manipulated by the propaganda that's being put about by the times. We're doing Islamic State's work for them. Because you and said earlier, who doesn't want to be on the winning side? Up, and when you've got that panic, that exaggeration and that uh, despair that's going about society, you want to be on that winning side. And that's why we've got a trail of young people going off to Iraq and Syria. So we stop terrorist attacks from happening by tackling the people that are perpetrating them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we champion the freedoms, freedom of debate, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, because we put it in a, in a stable environment where people can actually debate and we don't have the influence of one man at the top. Beg to propose. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jamie, and thanks to everyone for your contributions to the debate. It's been really interesting, and I'm sure we could have continued to carry on debating for many more hours. Um, I must say that when I first spoke in the Scottish Parliament way back in 99, my legs were like jelly, and I'm sure my voice was the same. And we have heard no such nerves from any of the young people who have addressed us this evening. So well done to everyone. Can I now ask the judges to adjourn and decide who's going to win this year's debating tournament? And I would also like to remind them that they have until, probably give you until 9.20, because we're running slightly late, to reach your decision. Thank you very much. Could I also take this opportunity, we will have a vote of thanks later, but if I could just take this opportunity to thank Gail Grant and Graham Donoghue, who have been helping me here this evening, also to thank the Events Assistance Broadcasting and the other Scottish Parliament staff. So I would like you to join me in thanking them, please. Can I now invite all of you to join me in the garden lobby for some refreshments and a chat and I'll ask that everyone is back and seated by 9.25 at the latest, please. Those on the chamber floor, could you just wait for a moment until you're instructed by a member of the events team how to get to the garden lobby. Thank you very much.